Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Cambridge Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring webinar on the Cambridge Wellbeing Check. I have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from today. Please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself. And we'd also love to know whether you're using a well-being check for your students already. And if so, uh, which one? Um, so please note that your microphones are muted. We can't hear any members of the audience, and this is to ensure good sound quality. If you would like to ask questions, um, please do. We'd love you to ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, there's a question section in the GoToWebinar control plan, uh, panel on the right side of your screen. Please feel free to put them there or in the, um, in the chat box. Uh, we'll see them in either place. Uh, you'll receive a certificate of attendance, which will be sent to your email inbox one hour after the webinar finishes. And we'll send around a copy of the webinar recording and the slides to you via email next week. Just a little bit about CHEM before I hand over to Mark. So CHEM is the Center for Evaluation and Monitoring. And we've been working with schools for 40 years this year, actually, um, in over 100 countries. We're known for our evidence-based research approach to baseline and formative assessments using extensive data sets to support future outcomes and development. We work with schools, ministries, and associations to transform the outcomes of the students they teach. And in 2019, we became part of the University of Cambridge, which has supported our reach and abilities to support young people across the world. We help teachers turn data into knowledge. We bridge the gap between research and practice, and we provide evidence to support good decision making. So with that, I'll hand over to Mark Fraser, who's our teaching and learning lead, to find out a bit more about the Cambridge Wellbeing Check. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Megan, and welcome along, everybody. Thank you very much for, for tuning in, and you know, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and you've chosen to join us tonight. We greatly appreciate it. So I'm uh, the teaching and learning lead, as Megan says, at uh, the C at CEM or CHEM, as, as we generally say, and I've been here for about eight years. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, a teacher and head teacher in different schools around the uh, the northeast of England, and really, I'm really interested in you know taking assessment information and trying to present it back to teachers in a usable and as you know formative a way as possible, so that you can make a difference to your learners in your settings. And tonight this afternoon this evening our focus is going to be well-being so it's 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 assessment but perhaps not as we know it we are finding out information about slightly different things so we're going to spend a bit of time talking about that thinking about what is well-being why it's important why we should even bother trying to assess it and then we'll tell you a little bit about our Cambridge well-being check it might give you some ideas uh, might uh, you might wish to sort of ask us more questions about it or you know, develop your own systems on the back of what you've seen and then finally just to round things off I'll just be imagining I'm sort of back in school and wondering what we could do to improve well-being in our own settings so we'll be looking at a few resources a few places that you can go for further information but before we start just a little recap on the recent past and I think we probably all know uh, numerous examples of how the world has changed in the past few years. Recently published research is beginning to show that problems are merely are not merely anecdotal. You know, there are some clear and quite negative trends becoming apparent. And there are a few surveys and research documents and publications which are um, coming to the surface. And I'm just going to pick out a couple. This first one, again, you can access what I'm about to show you on, on the internet uh, quite freely. So the Children's Society, they produced the, uh, the Good Childhood Report. This was published just last year, and it's based on a sample of data taken, taken from something called the British Household Panel Survey, which asks questions about all sorts of things in, in life in general. And there's a, a particular section about you know, children and young people and how they're feeling and how they're sort of, um, you know, functioning within society as a whole and sadly the last wave of the survey shows that uh, happiness generally 
and you know life satisfaction appears to be taking a downward dip reassuringly some things are quite stable and quite you know you know consistent you know how are young people feeling about family life that just seems to be sort of bobbing along quite nicely there that not nothing really is changing and contrast that against what young people are feeling as uh, in terms of their life as a whole that looks very much like it's a downward trend from 2009 10 onwards and school what they're feeling about school a little bit more erratic a few ups and downs in the you know in the curve here but really overall the picture is a little bit sort of gloomier we've we've gone down slightly in terms of the uh, the positivity you know children and young people show for for those aspects of their lives in addition uh, we had a, a, a recent within cambridge a recent um, publication which just came out a few weeks ago Again, you can follow the links when you get the slides to find these, or you can Google them now. And really, this is just pointing out, this was a questionnaire sent out to schools um, within the UK and internationally. And it's pointing out things that we possibly already know. You know, the well-being of teachers and students was reported to have been substantially impacted by the pandemic. And for teachers, that appeared to be at least partly to do with workload. However, for students, isolation and disruption to their normal schooling patterns appear to be the key concern and of all you know the respondents by respondents we mean teachers who filled this survey in and sent it back to us that 72 percent of them felt that their students well-being was worse you know 55 percent saying a little worse and 17 percent saying much worse as you can see on the graph here um other side of the coin, you know, there are some people who thought, you know, their, their children's well-being had uh, improved a little bit, or you know, the, sort of the, the lilac colour there in the middle showing that uh, maybe things haven't changed at all. But there's a big spike there, as we can see, on things being a little bit worse. Less of a, a spike there on a on a, a block on the burgundy block there of students who are perceived to be performing uh, less well since the pandemic. So not cheery news. So what can we do about it? I suppose that's what we're thinking about this afternoon. And first of all, I suppose we just need to think, what does well-being mean? And particularly, I think we're probably as an audience interested in most in terms of what is well-being in the sense of you know, school or college life for students. So the work we've been doing over the, the last uh, couple of years has been based on a, a paper from just before the pandemic, you know, 2015, which came out of the, you know, the Faculty of Education by uh, Ros McClellan and Susan Stewart. And their research is interesting in that it distinguishes between measures of well-being for adults and children, because there are some really nice studies out there that look at society quite broadly. and they're kind of considering the you know, well-being for adults and young people through the same sorts of lenses whereas this this work just looks at well-being of children and young people again the links there if you would like to read the, the whole publication you you can but it's um really just going to help us understand you know or it helped us understand when we're developing this you know what sorts of things can be changed what can we do what kinds of questions do we need to be asking young people uh, so that we can better understand their well-being and how they're feeling and hopefully allowing them to flourish so the theoretical model is based on two key pillars how young people are feeling and also how they they are functioning and below that that's then divided up into four main areas of well-being as you can see we've got life satisfaction you know that's how much students experience contentment and general you know overall satisfaction in life negative emotions you know how inclined they are to dwell on um, more sort of uh, worrying or anxious or stressful thoughts um, in terms of functioning interpersonal well-being that's relationships how well do they feel connected and supported and valued with those around them and finally there 
competence well-being that's about the 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 skills and the the positivity and the the the, the experience that they need to go out and succeed in the world of education and beyond that into the world of work so that's that's the basis that's i suppose that's a theoretical model under un, you know underpinning all of the things i'm going to be talking about for the rest of the session but there are some other things to think about with well-being and we've got to remember that uh, when we think about well-being it's a subjective psychological state so that means it changes over time and it can change according to context i mean it may change from month to month or even day to day and from one setting to another students may be feeling quite positive at home but are fairly down when they're in school or vice versa and because this is a you know, a, a psychological state, two children in identical material or physical circumstances might experience very different levels of well-being. In short, you know, one child might feel much more fulfilled and happier than another, despite very similar circumstances. So how on earth do we sort of unpick that? What do we do if we want to understand how children or young people are feeling? we must ask them about it and we can do that in a few different ways which we'll come to in a little while um, but firstly we're, we're just going to think of what what is well-being and how is it essential well we would suggest that if you are in a positive place then you will perform in a in a more sort of you know um, fruitful and sort of uh, constructive and positive way about everything that's going on around you. So teachers and educators need to take a keen interest in their students' well-being. And I think that's one of my central message to, messages today is well-being is essential to academic success. It's linked with forms of motivation you know basically students wanting to learn and if students want to learn they will they will make better progress. And it's also linked to sort of the, the wider engagement with school life. And of course, one of the things that I was measured on as a head when I was back in school was, was attendance, you know, how, how many students are in my school at any one time. And we know students who are disengaged are far more likely to truant, you know, to skip school. And if they're not in school, it's unlikely that they're, they're learning the things that we would want them to learn. And it's just, it's, it, it's common sense in many ways. So I don't think anything I'm saying should come as a, as a great surprise to you. But one of the things that our research touches on is that um, as well as this correlation between well-being and educational performance, there is a real difference to be made in terms of how schools address well-being. And there is a link between um, the consistency and having a whole school approach to well-being and supporting that and the eventual attainment of your students and this comes from a bit of research from uh, Irenka Suto and Tom Benton again two more Cambridge colleagues who, who published this last year and again I think at the end of towards the end of the the, uh, the session I'll talk a little bit more about what we can do from a, a school policy point of view and putting practical measures in place to support you know, a consistent and robust whole school approach. Maybe at that point we can just pause and Megan, I don't know if there's anything there in the chat just before we move on. Have we got uh, any any questions so far or any any remarks about what people are doing at the moment? Yeah, thanks Mark. We have a few people who've gotten in touch. Um, so Catherine has mentioned that they're not use, currently using a well-being check. Um, we've heard from Andy, who is actually, funny enough, using the well-being survey based on the Children's Society Good Childhood Index that you mentioned earlier. Oh, interesting. Um, good, good, good. Yeah, and is also taking part in the Greater Manchester Be Well survey. So that's the very good, the right? Um, yeah. We'll look out for that coming out. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. But, yeah. If anyone else has any, um, you know, well-being checks or any questions or anything, please feel free to send them through. Um, but that's all we've got for now, Mark. Good. Right. So moving on then. So why should we assess well-being? 
I suppose you could ask that question about anything. Why should we assess anything? Well, if you can assess or measure something, then you gather better information about it. The, and the more information you have, um, you increase your understanding of the situation you're in and the, you know, the circumstances surrounding your school, and you are in a better position to make decisions and take action. And this is as true of well-being as it is of geography or art or maths or PE or any of the things that we assess in school on a regular basis. Um, informally, an awful lot of assessment goes on um, in in sort of you know more formal academic subjects, and I think that's what teachers are doing in terms of well-being. You see your students, you talk to them, you get a feel of what you know what's going on, um, but. I think, you know, going back to my teacher training days, it's always the quiet ones that you need to watch out for. So the, the quiet, smiley children who never give, you know, uh, any kind of indication that there might be a problem, it's very easy to just assume that they're all right, but are they really? So I think what we need to do is just take a more objective and open approach and just popping back to the, the Good Childhood Report that's been mentioned a couple of times already. Um, we need to ask young people what they are actually thinking and feeling rather than just relying on adults' perceptions of that. And again, this report points that out, that you need to be doing something proactive. And what can we do you know, in a proactive way? Well, you could use a well-being check as we, we're gonna sort of explore a little bit more about. And you, know, you just think, well, why, why would we need to do that? Well, I think a well-being check lets you sort of teach and explore well-being with students because it allows you to kind of uncover any of the um, underlying problems or potential problems that may exist and you can look at individual students using a well-being check you can look at you know aggregate that data and look at groups of students or your, your whole school however you want to slice the data up and of course when you find areas that you may be concerned about naturally you're, you're going to do something about that you're going to put support or interventions in place and then you're going to wonder has it worked so suppose you you run your well-being check or your questionnaire or your your you know your study whatever you're going to do again and you look at your results and you evaluate the impact that your interventions made and hopefully you think well yep that really worked we'll keep doing that or oh my goodness that did not work we need to think again and do something else but unless you're measuring these things and gathering that information in other words, assessing it, you are going to be um, at a disadvantage, we would suggest. So a little bit about the Cambridge Wellbeing Check. Um, again, you can have a look at this and see what you think. And you might be using something like this. You might want to talk to us about using this, or you might want to develop your own from these ideas. And it's our system is um, a digital system. So it runs on any PC, tablet, or laptop. And we think this is really important because teachers have got enough to do in terms of paperwork. So we do not want to have any more marking involved in this. This is a system that the students log on to and they answer a very short questionnaire, just 22 questions. The questions are taken directly from the original um, research document that I referred to a few minutes ago. It's flexible. You can use this around your um, your school day when you, your students have timetabled to be, you know, in front of a computer. Perhaps this is something that can be fitted in in just a few minutes, and you can use it as often as you need to. So you can you know run a survey, find out what individual or group sort of concerns may be, put interventions in place, run it again as a check. It could be at the start of the year, it could be at the end of the year, it could be termly. It's up to you. You decide. Your your situation um, is best known to yourselves, and you've just got to work out what what would work most effectively. So the the system is just a very simple questionnaire, and the, the questions are deliberately very basic in terms of their um, their sort of literacy demands, because this is not a measurement of reading ability. This is not anything that should disadvantage children with special needs or um, children for whom English is an additional language. So we want this to be really simple, really unambiguous, easy to understand. And it's just a simple scale. We have a five point response scale. So it's about frequency of feeling. How often do you feel happy? 
and then you can see how often do you feel sad and you must think well why on earth have we got two kind of almost polar opposite questions but this is a real really useful um, common sense check in some ways in terms of if you've got students who are producing um, you know results in their, their responses that show that they are simultaneously very happy and very sad you might just think aha Mark has just sort of dashed through this questionnaire without kind of thinking about you know what he's doing here that in itself is a sign of disengagement so have a you know have a think about this when you're looking at your data as well or if you're making questions like this yourselves have a think about putting in these kind of safety net questions as well just that it's a common sense check from one to the other so as I said the scale we use just very very simple it's flipped around for the negative feelings so it's it's um, the, you know, the scale is reversed as you can see so the instead of the high values in indicating high well-being it's low well-being and we produce reports in different ways and we provide all of these will be in the slides at the end and I don't pretend you can read these so I'm just going to flick through them quite quickly but we have data in very simple tick box format we have data about individual students and groups where you can kind of look at a graph and see what's what's positive what's what's negative in terms of where are the low areas of um, response here and this is not a clinical instrument this is you know us shining a spotlight on a particular area that you might want to go off and find out a little bit more about so if you can see that you know a lot of your students are showing that they've got negative emotions well that's going to be the starting point that's what you're going to want to do you're going to want to think about what can we do to address this you're going to make further investigations in this area and think about the support that you can put in place we have also uh, descriptive reports which give kind of qualitative feedback and kind of take a lot of that anxiety about data out of the uh, equation and let students see that um, you know that this is not about numbers this is about how they are feeling and how they are functioning and it's it's presented in a much more kind of um, human way we hope and analytically behind the scenes as a teacher or a school leader you can drill down and look at the proportion of responses in each each of the questions again this is just dummy data but you can see that the, the the red draws your eye to the fact that 20 percent of children there or students are feeling that you know quite often feeling that they never do well and you think oh my goodness we need some you know intervention and support here this could be the you know, subject of uh, assemblies or you know focus activities in your know, pastoral groups however you want to do it when we're not providing you with um a, an exact sort of um you know root out of the the, the the issue here but we're going to give you lots of ideas you know, and point you in the direction of some resources that you might want to use in your own settings so the report the reports here again you can read these um, when when you get the slides but you can see that there is, is you know, a 12 different reports each uh, summarized in the table showing you how you might like to use those and our pack also comes with lesson plans as well so that you can see uh, what you might do in terms of introducing um, well-being and running a well-being check and then as a follow-up activity afterwards um, you can use them as scripts so you can cherry pick from them as good teachers always do but they're quite lengthy documents about 30 pages each and we also have guidance and support you can go onto our website you can uh, speak to you know our customer service team or you know you would receive sets of instructions from us as well so lots of different ways of, of tackling well-being so really that's just an example of you know what a well-being check might look like and then really I want to spend the, the you know the back half of the session just thinking about how in school we can think about improving well-being lots of guidance out there uh, freely available if you know you're a teacher in the UK you will be very familiar with the uh, the .gov.uk website perhaps and know that there are thousands of documents on it this one was produced uh, a few years ago but it's still really relevant I think and uh, again the link will be in the slides you'll be able to follow the link and find the document or you can you know, google it and find it yourselves but it's a great model if you are thinking about setting up a school um, policy or reviewing your policy or thinking about your your procedures around well-being 
and I'm going to pick out a couple of things from the document as well that you might wish to use. But again, some gloomy news in, in the document as well, in the introduction. That's uh, suggesting, you know, since 2017, you know, things have decreased slightly. You know, things are not as positive for children between the ages of, you know, five to 16. And, you know, a large, you know, section of these children may have probable mental health disorders. And as we know, you know, the pandemic possibly isn't over in terms of its effects and w the world is changing. There are things that have happened in the last couple of years that we would never have imagined. Cost of living crisis, you know, war in Europe, um, food problems, food supply problems, um, all, all sorts of, you know, cost of living related and, you know, geopolitical issues that maybe do not seem to be, uh, you know, affecting us directly in some cases. But it's it's worrying how children and young people are little sponges and they just kind of pick up, they feed off this anxiety. So we just need to be aware of what's going on. So if you need to be aware of what's going on, what can you do in your school? So here are eight areas that you might want to think about. And you can see the ones that I've circled in red are things that you could affect directly using a well-being check or a survey of some sort. So you would use your check to find out what the areas of concern were, what are the issues that keep cropping up, what are, what are young people worried about? That can then be sort of fed into your curriculum planning. You know, what do we need to be working on here? What can we be doing with these, these children and young people? It's, it's enabling their voice. We're hearing from them directly. And also um, it's, it's just identifying the areas where you need to sort of focus and look at and monitor and work out how effective your, your interventions are. And you can go looking for information in other places. Uh, just point out, this is a, a really nice website that we like, uh, anafreud.org. We are not connected with them in any way, but we just like their work. And they have a really nice uh, bank of resources there. There are some lovely things to go and look at. Lots of ideas about management, you know, leading change, working together as a school. That's not just staff, but that's students and staff, uh, you know, understanding the need, promoting well-being, and again, just supporting staff and everybody in the community. So, again, some of these websites that I'm showing you, you might just want to double check because there are, you know, sensitive things on there. Maybe you do not consider it age appropriate to be discussing some of the things that are shown here. So if you're in a primary setting, for instance, or, you know, secondary setting, your concerns are going to be very different. So just check before you, you know, share your resources uh, more widely. But we've uh, recently got into um, a partnership arrangement with teentips.co.uk. They're a, a great um, source of uh, information. There are you know, some free services here. There are some you know, paid for services, but again, you can have a look and see what you think. They've got a really nice uh, wellbeing hub for children and young people. So with some really nice ideas of what you can do to, as activities to address wellbeing in your particular setting. And just moving towards the, the end of the, 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 uh, the webinar really, there's just one thing that we can always do with young people, especially children who are moving in and out of our schools. You know, when you, you can see they, they are new students, particularly who come mid-year um, and they're, they're struggling to make those relationships and those friendships. It's just make sure that every student has formed at least one strong support of professional relationship with an adult in school, because we all need somebody to talk to when things get tough. And that's, Free. You know, we can all do that and we can do that tomorrow. As, as I mentioned before, it's, it's the quiet ones we need to watch out for. So we need to just make sure that all children have a, a, a way of flagging up any problems or concerns that they have. That could be through a survey, a questionnaire, or just through the kind of informal well-being activities that you can do in the classroom. And if they can see a supportive environment around them and they can see that other students are prepared to sort of share their thoughts and their feelings, maybe that just encourages those more anxious students to um, join in and to tell us what they're thinking as well. And hopefully using all that information, you can take that back to your schools and settings and make a difference 
to the well-being of your children and young people. So thank you very much for listening. It's always particularly um, difficult to listen after a long day at school, so we greatly appreciate your uh, joining us this afternoon. And just to round off, I think maybe we can go back to Megan, and if there are any questions, we can try and answer them for you. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, there's a question here from Julie who asks, are students honest about their feelings when it's not an anonymous survey? Um, possibly not. And I think that's what I was getting at in that, that last sort of summing up there in terms of we've got to make sure that students feel safe and secure and any information that they disclose is treated with the, you know, the, the strictest confidence. Confidence doesn't mean we're not going to tell anybody. You know, as we know from um, safeguarding training, if a student flags up an issue, we as teachers and uh, educators need to make it clear that we may have to involve other people depending on the seriousness of the situation. But I suppose what I'm advocating here is we have a number of options where students can respond um, through a survey or informally through um, you know, just the activities, you know, like the, some of the lesson plans we've got, we've got really nice examples of say like sticky note activities where they can be semi-anonymous and you can, you know, put things out onto, um, you know, flip charts and whiteboards and, you know, all the rest of it where we're sharing our sort of feelings um, discreetly. Or I suppose if you are really concerned about students not wanting to come and, and speak to you, I suppose, that that whole kind of relationship building and positivity and you know developing a culture of trust is something that really needs to be chipped away at and you know, you can have anonymous surveys but i don't know if that's helpful in some ways because I, I know you know going back to you know when i've been in school um when we we did service with parents in particular if if people wrote worrying things to you um and they send anonymous letters in or you know the things that sometimes happen in schools it's quite um it, it, you know it can be quite difficult to deal with because you may not know for sure exactly who is worried or is feeling anxious or is you know is in a particularly awkward situation if they're not telling you so suppose provide a variety of options and build that trust and be supportive and be encouraging and hopefully students will come forward and talk to us and we can help them. That's great. Thank you, Mark. There's another question here from Bridget who asks, is there something similar for assessing well-being in adult learners or staff? Um, not from Cambridge as yet, but I, I know there are other things out there which I, I can't really sort of promote. But if you if you have a, a look around, there are different things out there. But yeah, I mean, it's a really important issue and it's something we've talked about in Cambridge. Is that going to be our next step? Perhaps perhaps something is in the pipeline because if you know the students and function, their sort of feelings and functioning is really important, but so are the staff because if the staff aren't in a position to um, support the students, then we have no hope. So we need to be putting those uh, measures in place as well, but I'm afraid we can't give you that just yet, but have a look out there. I was at an event up in uh, County Durham last week and there's definitely something on the market, but I just can't, can't sort of uh, recommend it here, but just have a, have a Google, I would say. Great, thank you very much. There's a couple of questions as well around access to the slides and the recording. Um, so just uh, to say that, yes, both of those will be sent around to you um, within the next week or so. Um, so feel free to, to share those with colleagues as well, if you would like. Um, but I think that's all for the questions, Mark. Um, so maybe just to say, uh, if any questions do pop into your head you know, after the end of the webinar, please do feel free to get in touch. We'd be happy to answer them for you. Um, you can get in touch at chem, which is C-E-M, at cambridge.org. Um, and just a big thank you to both Mark for presenting today and to all of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to come and have a listen. Um, so, yeah, we'll be sending the slides and the recording around next week. But um, I think that just leaves me to say thank you again for coming and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.